Today we'll be our fourth and final webinar in our four-part series funded by Farm Credit Canada. Today's webinar will be on the topic of a good night's sleep, sleep in agriculture. Our presenter today is Dr. Mark Fenton, Associate Professor of the Division of Res Respirology, Critical Care and Sleep here at the University of Saskatchewan. If you do have any questions, we will have a Q&A period at the end where you can enter your questions into the chat box. Hello, um, I can see there's a couple of people online, so welcome. Um, so I was asked to present about sleep in the context of agriculture. So the objectives of this are basically to give you some understanding of what normal sleep and sleep needs would be, uh, what the impact of sleep disruption would be, because I think uh, most people in the agricultural sec sector are not uh, strangers to sleep disruption, um, and then uh, some strategies to maybe uh, mitigate some of that. So normal sleep, um, sleep is a, is a basic biologic function that's necessary for our survival. So one sort of concept around sleep is to think of it as an adaptive inactivity. And you can think of that in the terms of historically back when uh, we were being hunted by things, we would be still at night in the dark so they couldn't find us. But I think the more modern uh, interpretation of that would be that it's adaptive in the sense that it allows us to recover. So it's, its actual function specifically isn't known, but we know that it's restorative and that if you don't get enough sleep, then things start to deteriorate and it affects basically every organ system. And sleep is something that's controlled by your circadian clock that's driven by uh, your brain and is um, basically a, a mechanism to establish rhythms such as sleep and bowel habit and appetite and so on. Um, and with respect to sleep, it's driven by the uh, exposure to light. So light enters your eye and then that comes to the brain and that starts to set the cycle for you. And of course, there's a homeostatic drive as well, uh, which helps you sort of maintain a balance of sleep versus awake time. So this comes from something called UpToDate, which uh, I'm grateful that they were able to, to allow me to use this. Um, the, uh, uh, this gives you a, a picture of what sleep needs are over the course of a, a normal human lifespan. So you can see that when you're an infant, you need an enormous amount of sleep, and that, that actually is maintained right through the years where you're growing. And part of the reason for that is, is that growth, homo growth hormone secretion is occurring during sleep. And so that's a, a really important thing for a growing organism. And then by the time you're an adult, you're needing somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep on average. There's a few people that need a bit more than that and a few people that need a little less than that, but that would be sort of a benchmark for most people. So if you're asking yourself, how much sleep should I be getting at night? A simple answer would be at least seven hours. So the other thing I wanted to, to highlight here is that sleep is an important thing for, for you as a person. And, you know, popular culture and society tells us that it's something expendable that we can spend and, you know, we can um, exchange it for fun and, and work and so on. But there are limits to that. And um, you need to, to uh, think of it more like a gas tank that needs to be refilled. So when sleep is lost, as I said, there's impacts on a variety of, of things. The things that are most appreciable to, to most individuals are impaired concentration of memory, slow, slowing of reaction times, some impairment in judgment, uh, irritability, and in some people even depression. And then there's the whole issue of workplace accidents and motor vehicle accidents. So we know that people that are sleep deprived because of the reaction times, impairments in judgment and concentration, they're more at risk of, of having an accident. And so um, <clears throat> you could think of being sleep deprived as being akin to driving drunk. So sleep can be disrupted for a variety of reasons. You have to be up for to attend to a child. You have to be up because of work uh, related things. And then it may be related to some sleep disorders. And there's two very common ones that I thought I would highlight. Uh, the first is insomnia and the second obstructive sleep apnea. So insomnia is something that's very prevalent in Canada. Uh, around 12% of the population struggles with insomnia at one point in their life. And basically it's an inability to initiate or maintain sleep that leads to a shortening of the sleep time 
and is accompanied by some kind of impairment. And that may be fatigue, concentration, irritability, the things that I mentioned, or it may be impacting their social lives or, or other things. So there needs to be some form of dysfunction, as it were, uh, in order to call it a disorder as opposed to just a shorter sleep time than, than the average person. And there's a variety of potential causes for insomnia, but the most common would be psychophysiologic or a busy mind, and often that's driven by stress. Stress is uh, a pretty active state from a physiology point of view. Stress hormones are uh, designed to make us uh, ready to fight or flight. Um, so they're sort of the opposite effect of relaxing and going to sleep. Um, and this is the primary cause of the psychophysiologic insomnia that I, that I mentioned. So there's a strong relationship between this and um, self-reported stress and sleep disturbance. And interestingly, it's not so much about the fact that you've experienced something stressful in the day before, but rather the anticipation of stress coming uh, in the future so-called rumination, and it's those ruminating thoughts that tend to keep people awake. And this is actually an area of a lot of investigation to try and sort out the, the whys and hows of this, and we know there are some ways to, to mitigate that. So it's something that varies over a course of a person's lifetime, so people are quote-unquote prone to that, um, and, and there will be periods where it's more problematic than others, and stressful times in life, of course, will be uh, correlating with that. But the ways to kind of think of how do I manage this, if you're someone that, that experiences that, would be to pay attention to sleep hygiene. So that's just your habits around sleep, and we'll talk about that. Maybe look at ways to manage stress. And then something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically just reframing the lens with which you're looking at some of the thoughts that are driving the, the process. And that may be around the stress management, but often these, uh, the issue of insomnia acquires a life of its own, and then the whole thinking around sleep needs to be realigned as well. So it can be quite effective, and then, to be honest, is uh, better than, than using a sleeping pill, which uh, many people employ. So in the context of the uh, agricultural world, you can see that uh, on the left that you know, there's some seasonal variation to the amount of work that's being done, and that, that seems to correlate with the amount of accidents that are occurring, which I guess makes sense. But I think it also has to do with the, the, uh, the long, long work hours, and you know, a 70-hour work week may not all be during the day too. So for example, during calving season, if you happen to have livestock, a lot of that time may be in the middle of the night and quite disruptive to your sleep, and therefore it makes sense that that might translate to some uh, increases in uh, accidents related to judgment and so on. So obstructive sleep apnea is a very common thing. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada reports that about 26% of the population would be considered high risk. If you look at U.S. data, the prevalence of sleep apnea in men is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% and 15% in women, so very common. Um, it's associated with many things, including some problematic heart things, so it's associated with high blood pressure and difficulty controlling that, increased risk of heart attack, increased risk of stroke, and certainly increased use of healthcare utilization. Um, people with obstructive sleep apnea that's untreated tend to have decreased workplace productivity, this has some negative impacts on the economy. And then there's a, a significant increase in the risk of motor vehicle accident. And in fact, in the US, the estimate of what it costs their economy every year is about $16 billion in terms of motor vehicle accidents related to untreated obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a, a big issue in this uh, population. So risk factors, if you're a guy, that's a risk factor. As you get older, that's a risk factor. As you get fatter, that's a risk factor. And if you have a first degree family member with obstructive sleep apnea, that increases your risk as well. The things that you might look for uh, that might be clues to this, loud snoring is very common. A, a partner or spouse who's saying, well, you stop breathing in your sleep. Daytime fatigue and sleepiness, poor concentration, irritability, maybe depression. A lot of the signs and symptoms that I described that are related to sleep uh, loss and sleep disruption, because obstructive sleep apnea is essentially a form of sleep disruption and loss related to repeated collapse of the throat. 
and the brain has to wake up to correct that problem repeatedly over the course of a night. So the diagnosis includes, you know, seeing a physician or a healthcare provider and, and then undergoing some testing looking for the signals that would support that diagnosis, either doing a test at home or doing a test in a sleep laboratory. And there are reasons why we might choose one over the other that we're not going to go into today, but uh, both are established ways to, uh, to, ach- uh, to make a diagnosis. And then the treatment is, generally speaking, something called CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure. So that's our gold standard treatment. That's what we know will definitively eliminate the problem in the throat I described and uh, uh, fix the problem or compensate for the problem. A second line treatment to that would be a dental appliance, which holds the jaw in place and prevents it from falling back. That's most appropriate in people with mild sleep apnea as opposed to severe. And of course, lifestyle interventions are important as well. So weight loss, if, if, you, if the patient is overweight, avoidance of alcohol in the evenings, because alcohol is a permissive effect on the collapse of the throat, and smoking cessation because that's an airway irritant which contributes to the problem. And of course, as a respirologist, I tell everyone they should quit smoking because it's bad for them in other ways too. So the recipe for sleep health. Routine is a key component. So one might think of it as a ritual for bedtime, but having a routine that you follow at bedtime, whether it's reading a book or having a hot bath, whatever the case it is, Doing that uh, helps establish and set the stage for relaxation to establish sleep. Your wake-up time, if you're trying to establish a sleep cycle, is going to be the anchor because it's a lot easier to will yourself to be awake than it is to uh, will yourself to be asleep. So I generally tell my patients that if you're trying to reestablish the cycle, set a regular wake-up time and stick to it uh, regardless of when you fall asleep at night. The bedroom should be cool, dark, and quiet. Avoid meals after, you know, mid-evening. Or certainly don't eat by bedtime. That generally produces a disrupted sleep. Alcohol I talked about in the context of sleep apnea, but it actually has a negative impact on sleep, even in someone without a sleep disorder. Changes the architecture of sleep in terms of the staging and cycle of staging, as well as uh, produces a less restful sleep that's generally more disrupted. Avoid smoking because nicotine is a stimulant and similarly one would avoid caffeine. And then of course, pay attention to the other things we talked about. If your spouse is telling you that you snore or there's gaps in breathing at night, you should probably see your physician to explore the possibility of obstructive sleep apnea. And if you're struggling with insomnia, cognitive behavioral therapy is an effective treatment strategy and one that I would recommend Uh, over the use of sleeping pills. So what about seeding and harvest time and calving for the uh, people that are doing those things? Well, sometimes sleep restriction or a a loss of sleep can't be avoided. Um, I work in in a field where sleep disruption happens as well. So the way to to try and cope with that is to change your your daytime activities a little bit and if necessary, create an opportunity for about a 40-minute nap sometime around midday. And there's some good evidence that that actually restores some of the cognitive issues that arise from sleep loss and will improve your concentration, improve your uh, ability to react to things and improve uh, productivity. And of course, you would also want to try and follow those other issues uh, that I raised in the description of good sleep health in terms of routine as best you can and so on. So, That pretty much sums up what I wanted to communicate to to you as a a group in terms of uh, sleep. So I'm hoping by this point you at least have some sense of what to expect in terms of normal sleep time and what normal sleep is, what the impact of that disruption can be, and maybe some ways to try and address that either with pursuing some treatments and investigations around potential sleep disorders, but also strategies to try and cope with some of the sleep disruption that comes from uh, running an agricultural operation. So thanks for having me here, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. If anyone has any questions, they can feel free to uh, enter them into the chat box.
And if not, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our final webinar series. Uh, if you uh, know anybody who missed this webinar by chance, they will all be available on our website in the future for uh, you to access at any time. Thanks.